Chapter 6 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 6 The Black Pirates of Barsoom. What is it? I asked the girl. For answer, she pointed to the sky. I looked, and there above us, I saw shadowy bodies flitting hither and thither high over temple, court, and garden. Almost immediately, flashes of light broke from these strange objects. There was a roar of musketry, and then answering flashes and roars from temple and rampart. "'The black pirates of Barsoom, O Prince,' said Thuvia. In great circles the aircraft of the marauders swept lower and lower toward the defending forces of the therns. Volley after volley they vomited upon the temple guards. Volley on volley crashed through the thin air toward the fleeting and elusive flyers. As the pirates swooped closer toward the ground, thern soldiery poured from the temples into the gardens and courts. The sight of them in the open brought a score of flyers darting toward us from all directions. The therns fired upon them through shields affixed to the rifles. But on, steadily on, came the grim black craft. They were small flyers for the most part built for two to three men. A few larger ones there were, but these kept high aloft dropping bombs upon the temples from their keel batteries. At length, with a concerted rush, evidently in response to a signal of command, the pirates in our immediate vicinity dashed recklessly to the ground in the very midst of the thern soldiery. Scarcely waiting for their craft to touch, the creatures manning them leapt among the therns with the fury of demons. Such fighting! Never had I witnessed its like before. I had thought the green Martians the most ferocious warriors in the universe, but the awful abandon with which the black pirates threw themselves upon their foes transcended everything I ever before had seen. Beneath the brilliant light of Mars' two glorious moons, the whole scene presented itself in vivid distinctness the golden-haired, white-skinned therns battling with desperate courage in hand-to-hand -hand conflict with their ebony-skinned foemen. Here a little knot of struggling warriors trampled a bed of gorgeous pamelia. There the curved sword of a black man found the heart of a thern and left its dead foeman at the foot of a wondrous statue carved from living ruby. Yonder a dozen therns pressed a single pirate back upon a bench of emerald, upon whose iridescent surface a strangely beautiful Barsoomian design was traced out in inlaid diamonds. A little to one side stood Thuvia, the Thark, and I. The tide of battle had not reached us, but the fighters from time to time swung close enough that we might distinctly note them. The black pirates interested me immensely. I had heard vague rumors, little more than legends they were, during my former life on Mars but never had I seen them, nor talked with one who had. They were popularly supposed to inhabit the lesser moon, from which they descended upon Barsoom at long intervals. Where they visited they wrought the most horrible atrocities, and when they left carried away with them firearms and ammunition, and young girls as prisoners. These latter, the rumor had it, they sacrificed to some terrible god in an orgy which ended in the eating of their victims. I had an excellent opportunity to examine them, as the strife occasionally brought now one and now another close to where I stood. They were large men, possibly six feet and over in height. Their features were clear-cut and handsome in the extreme. Their eyes were all well set and large, though a slight narrowness lent them a crafty appearance. The iris as well as I could determine by moonlight was of extreme blackness while the eyeball itself was quite white and clear. The physical structure of their bodies seemed identical with those of the therns, the red men, and my own. Only in the color of their skin did they differ materially from us, that is, of the appearance of polished ebony, and, odd as it may seem for a southerner to say it, adds to rather than detracts from their marvelous beauty." but if their bodies are divine, their hearts, apparently, are quite the reverse. Never did I witness such a malign lust for blood as these demons of the outer air evinced in their mad battle with the therns. All about us in the garden lay their sinister craft, 
which the therns, for some reason, then unaccountable to me, made no effort to injure. Now and again a black warrior would rush from a nearby temple bearing a young woman in his arms. Straight for his flyer he would leap, while those of his comrades who fought nearby would rush to cover his escape. The therns on their side would hasten to rescue the girl, and in an instant the two would be swallowed in the vortex of a maelstrom of yelling devils, hacking and hewing at one another like fiends incarnate. But always, it seemed, were the black pirates of Barsoom victorious, and the girl, brought miraculously unharmed through the conflict, borne away into the outer darkness upon the deck of a swift flyer. Fighting similar to that which surrounded us could be heard in both directions as far as sound carried, and Thuvia told me that the attacks of the black pirates were usually made simultaneously along the entire ribbon-like domain of the therns, which circles the valley door on the outer slopes of the mountains of Ots. As the fighting receded from our position for a moment, Thuvia turned toward me with a question. "'Do you understand now, O Prince,' she said, "'why a million warriors guard the domains of the holy therns by day and by night? The scene you are witnessing now is but a repetition of what I have seen enacted a score of times during the fifteen years I have been a prisoner here. From time immemorial the black pirates of Barsoom have preyed upon the holy therns. Yet they never carried their expeditions to a point, as one might readily believe it was in their power to do, where the extermination of the race of therns is threatened. It is as though they but utilize the race as playthings, with which they satisfy their ferocious lust for fighting, and from whom they collect toll in arms and ammunition and in prisoners. Why don't they jump in and destroy these flyers? I asked. That would soon put a stop to the attacks, or at least the blacks would scarce be so bold. Why, see how perfectly unguarded they leave their craft, as though they were lying safe in their own hangars at home. The therns do not dare. They tried it once, ages ago, but the next night, and for a whole moon thereafter, a thousand great black battleships circled the mountains of Ots, pouring tons of projectiles upon the temples, the gardens, and the courts, until every thern who was not killed was driven for safety into the subterranean galleries. The therns know that they live at all only by the sufferance of the black men. They were near to extermination that once, and they will not venture risking it again. As she ceased talking, a new element was instilled into the conflict. It came from a source equally unlooked for by either Thern or Pirate. The great banths which we had liberated in the garden had evidently been awed at first by the sound of the battle, the yelling of the warriors, and the loud report of rifle and bomb. But now they must have become angered by the continuous noise, and excited by the smell of new blood. For all of a sudden a great form shot from a clump of low shrubbery into the midst of a struggling mass of humanity. A horrid scream of bestial rage broke from the banth as he felt warm flesh beneath his powerful talons. As though his cry was but a signal to the others, the entire great pack hurled themselves among the fighters. Panic reigned in an instant. Thern and black man turned alike against the common enemy, for the banths showed no partiality toward either. The awful beasts bore down a hundred men by a mere weight of their great bodies as they hurled themselves into the thick of the fight. Leaping and clawing, they mowed down the warriors with their powerful paws, turning for an instant to rend their victims with frightful fangs. The scene was fascinating in its terribleness but suddenly it came to me that we were wasting valuable time watching this conflict, which in itself might prove a means of our escape. The therns were so engaged with their terrible assailants that now, if ever, escape should be comparatively easy. I turned to search for an opening through the contending hordes. If we could but reach the ramparts we might find that the pirates somewhere had thinned the guarding forces and left a way open to us to the world without. As my eyes wandered about the garden, the sight of the hundreds of aircraft lying unguarded around us suggested the simplest avenue to freedom. Why it had not occurred to me before, 
I was thoroughly familiar with the mechanism of every known make of flyer on Barsoom. For nine years I had sailed and fought with the Navy of Helium. I had raced through space on the tiny one-man air scout, and I had commanded the greatest battleship that ever had floated in the thin air of dying Mars. To think with me is to act. Grasping Thuvia by the arm, I whispered to Tars Tarkas to follow me. Quickly we glided toward a small flyer which lay furthest from the battling warriors. Another instant found us huddled on the tiny deck. My hand was on the starting lever. I pressed my thumb upon the button which controls the ray of repulsion, that splendid discovery of the Martians which permits them to navigate the thin atmosphere of their planet in huge ships that dwarf the dreadnoughts of our earthly navies into pitiful significance. The craft swayed slightly, but she did not move. Then a new cry of warning broke upon our ears. Turning, I saw a dozen black pirates dashing toward us from the melee. We had been discovered. With shrieks of rage the demons sprang for us. With frenzied insistence I continued to press the little button which should have sent us racing out into space, but still the vessel refused to budge. Then it came to me, the reason that she would not rise. We had stumbled upon a two-man flyer. Its ray tanks were charged only with sufficient repulsive energy to lift two ordinary men. The Thark's great weight was anchoring us to our doom. The blacks were nearly upon us. There was not an instant to be lost in hesitation or doubt. I pressed the button far in and locked it. Then I set the lever at high speed, and as the blacks came yelling upon us, I slipped from the craft's deck and with drawn longsword met the attack. At the same moment a girl's shriek rang out behind me and an instant later, as the blacks fell upon me, I heard, far above my head and faintly, in Thuvia's voice, "'My prince! Oh, my prince! I would rather remain and die with—' But the rest was lost in the noise of my assailants. I knew, though, that my ruse had worked, and that, temporarily at least, Thuvia and Tars Tarkas were safe, and the means of escape was theirs. For a moment it seemed that I could not withstand the weight of numbers that confronted me, but again, as on so many other occasions when I had been called upon to face fearful odds upon this planet of warriors and fierce beasts, I found that my earthly strength so far transcended that of my opponents that the odds were not so greatly against me as they appeared. My seething blade wove a net of death about me. For an instant the blacks pressed close to reach me with their shorter swords, but presently they gave back, and the esteem in which they suddenly had learned to hold my sword-arm was writ large upon each countenance. I knew, though, that it was but a question of minutes before their greater numbers would wear me down or get around my guard. I must go down eventually to certain death before them. I shuddered at the thought of it, dying thus in this terrible place where no word of my end ever could reach my Dejah Thoris, dying at the hands of nameless black men in the gardens of the cruel therns. Then the old-time spirit reasserted itself. The fighting blood of my Virginian sires coursed hot through my veins. The fierce bloodlust and the joy of battle surged over me. The fighting smile that has brought consternation to a thousand foemen touched my lips. I put the thought of death out of my mind, and fell upon my antagonists with fury that those who escaped will remember to their dying day. That others would press to the support of those who faced me I knew, so even as I fought I kept my wits at work, searching for an avenue of escape. It came from an unexpected quarter out of the black night behind me. I had just disarmed a huge fellow who had given me a desperate struggle, and for a moment the blacks stood back for a breathing spell. They eyed me with malignant fury, yet withal there was a touch of respect in their demeanor. Thurn, said one, you fight like a dator, but for your detestable yellow hair and your white skin you would be an honor to the first born of Barsoom. I am no Thurn, I said 
and was about to explain that I was from another world, thinking that by patching a truce with these fellows and fighting with them against the Therns I might enlist their aid in regaining my liberty. But just at that moment a heavy object smote me a resounding whack between my shoulders that nearly fell me to the ground. As I turned to meet this new enemy an object passed over my shoulder, striking one of my assailants squarely in the face and knocking him senseless to the sward. At the same instant I saw that the thing that had struck us was the trailing anchor of a rather fair-sized air vessel, possibly a ten-man cruiser. The ship was floating slowly above us, not more than fifty feet over our heads. Instantly the one chance for escape that it offered presented itself to me. The vessel was slowly rising, and now the anchor was beyond the blacks who faced me and several feet above their heads. With a bound that left them gaping in wide-eyed astonishment, I sprang completely over them. A second leap carried me just high enough to grasp the now rapidly receding anchor. But I was successful, and there I hung by one hand, dragging through the branches of the higher vegetation of the gardens, while my late foeman shrieked and howled beneath me. Presently the vessel veered toward the west, and then swung gracefully to the south. In another instant I was carried beyond the crest of the golden cliffs, out over the valley door, where, six thousand feet below me, the lost sea of chorus lay shimmering in the moonlight. Carefully I climbed to a sitting posture across the anchor's arms. I wondered if by chance the vessel might be deserted. I hoped so. Or possibly it might belong to a friendly people and have wandered by accident almost within the clutches of the pirates and the therns. The fact that it was retreating from the scene of battle lent color to this hypothesis. But I decided to know positively and at once, so with the greatest caution I commenced to climb slowly up the anchor chain toward the deck above me. One hand had just reached for the vessel's rail and found it, when a fierce black face was thrust over the side and eyes filled with triumphant hate looked into mine. End of chapter 6